For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon Derehove. Political analysts Ibrahim Fakir and Ivor Sarakinski join me to discuss the realignment of politics in South Africa, as well as the disintegration of COPE as an opposition party to the ruling ANC. You have just recently edited a book with Tom Lodge on political parties in Africa, as well as co-authored a long article on party factionalism and the decline of COPE. In your edited volume, you say that it is both a critical voice and constructive problem solver, where you and Tom Lodge appear to suggest that the benchmarks you develop may aid parties organizationally and perhaps aid societies in general to anchor open, competitive political systems. How? Well, the first point is that it's not just us who've decided that uh, these so-called normative benchmarks would help parties organizationally, but also society. So it's the parties themselves um, in which we convened a kind of symposium in which parties from across the continent were part of contributing to, to devising this, these benchmarks. But before that, there was also a panel of international experts on political parties who we convened to, 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 to come up with the first draft. Um, but be that as it may, uh, I think what these benchmarks do, and I think it's quite clear, we're not, we're not, we're not suggesting that they're analytic or that they are, uh, that, that, that they are a kind of panacea for all the ills, but it's the parties themselves who are saying that if we did these or conform to these values organizationally, we might perform better as organizations. So they, you know, obviously subscribe to certain values like honesty, integrity, um, inclusivity, being representative, etc. That's just a set of values. And then, you know, they they themselves suggested that their policy making processes should be open, should be inclusive, should consult their members. Um, they also believe that internal rules are important for how they go about doing their business, making decisions, electing leaders and so forth. So so they believe organizationally that would make them better organizations. In terms of, of society in terms of society in general, the party system as a whole, um, it's they who suggest that openness ought to be a key virtue, that if it's open you might be able to contest equally with other parties for power, that you should have good relations with the electoral commission when you when you when you're going for elections, that there ought to be a code of conduct which precludes certain kinds of activities, that there shouldn't be hate speech. So these are values they themselves have, have subscribed to. But and I agree that if they were internalized, parties would both be organizationally better, but you'd also have more democratic party systems. But it doesn't always work that way in practice. Um, and I think Ivo would, would explain why, because I think parties try to sort of use some of these rules to their own advantage. Both in, so factions inside a party would do that, uh, and parties as a whole would do that in relation to other parties. The benchmarks perhaps are best uh, seen as a guide for building cohesive, strong parties because most societies need that for the political system to function efficiently. Um, but again, there's such a divergence of country experiences that one can't expect all countries to have the same rules, the same processes for parties. So there has to be some place for innovation, for difference, for accommodating differences, especially when parties need to organize in very different conditions. And that's when things can start to get interesting because it can be abused, but at the same time, it can be very innovative in dealing with specific uh, country issues. And, and one sees this often is the internal rules. If, if parties are encouraged to have internal rules, those rules become part of internal party politics where factions use the rules to outmaneuver their opponents inside the party. And we, we saw that in COPE to some extent, uh, and, and it's, it's quite common. Um, also benchmarks on transparency and all of that and openness, while, while desirable in, in many contexts, those kinds of practices can have unintended consequences, which can impact quite negatively on the chances of some parties. And the, the, big, the big example in, the, in that is uh, the private donations and the regulation of private donations. Um, it can be very helpful to some parties, 
to have disclosure because it puts pressure on the opponents. Um, so you can intimidate donors into supporting you and not others uh, through supporting and encouraging donations. So these are quite sensitive issues and, and as, as a guideline uh, rather than a benchmark, I think, uh, even, they, they can be helpful. If COPE had followed some of the benchmarks suggested in the book, would they have maintained, in your opinion, a degree of organisational integrity? For a period, yes. I, I think they could have maintained a degree of organisational integrity had they followed all the internal benchmarks. But I also believe that because of the nature of the contest within COPE, and the importation of that contest within COPE from the parent party, the ANC, that it would simply have been a matter of time before it would have imploded politically. So it, it might have in the interim period for a slightly longer period perhaps maintained a degree of organisational integrity, but it would have been politically dead. Uh, would have lost a degree of political vitality and it would only be a matter of time before the politics would have inserted itself, there would have been massive internal contests about the direction of the party, about how it would relate to the parent party from which it broke away from the ANC, but also how it would relate to opposition parties. And then organisationally, of course, if they followed the benchmarks about certain positions, openness of internal contest, that might have that might have maintained a degree of internal integrity. But it wouldn't as a matter if I'm saying as a matter of time, in a matter of time, if the politics had intervened, those rules for internal contest would have been undermined eventually. So I think in the case of COPE, it was a matter of of when, not if. I think that if if the benchmark rules were in place, they would have been used in the internal factional fight. So transparency would have used by one group against the other group and vice versa in competing and contesting for the leadership because it was a zero-sum fight between two strong personalities. And everything that was in the party was part of that fight. And the, the benchmarks and the rules would have got sucked into that. The, the rules to some extent or the benchmarks may have also increased the level of pressure in terms of putting a plug on it for a while so that when it did blow up it, it may even have been worse. At a theoretical level your study suggests that political parties that are formed to represent a constituency are more likely to survive than parties that are formed as the result of a split from another party. Why do you think this is the case? Well simply because if you're formed to represent a specific constituency and by constituency we just don't mean a set of people, we mean a set of ideas, um, a set of principles, a set of values, then you are, you are organizing along that basis. Uh, it has slightly more durability, it has a greater degree of coherence and it has a greater degree of sustainability into the future. To the extent that you have contestation around them, uh, which is inevitable, I think, in most parties, mm -hmm. the, the eye on the prize remains those that constituency, those values, those principles, uh, or those policies for that matter. So, so it's an attempt to kind of cobble together some degree of diversity and difference, but which still lays allegiance to a broader set of principles. And what happened in the case of COPE was that they imported those from the ANC. So there's very little that you could distinguish COPE from in terms of what uh, it, it, it stood for vis-a-vis -vis the ANC. It was also true, depending on which portion of COPE you looked at, you would have found that they would have found some accord with what other opposition parties stood for. So literally it was a pond which looked a lot like uh, another pond, or it was the same pond within which they were fishing for, for votes and for support. So, so, so that's the one problem. The second is that inevitably, because of this importation of <clears throat> at least the broad values, principles, constituency, ideas that COPE stood for, uh, much of that battle was imported from the ANC into COPE. And so the contestation, bitter as it was in the ANC, remained as bitter in COPE. Mm -hmm. Added to it was a layer of people's allegiance to specific individuals uh, in the party. And as Ivo is suggesting, uh, 
they used the, those individuals were using their own internal rules to um, to to further their own chances or the chances of their faction uh, to be in power. Because remember, they had two congresses, two conferences, which 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 had to be abandoned because the two leaders were unable to see eye to eye on when it should happen. So it was a rule about when it ought to happen in terms of the interim constitution. They couldn't respect that. Uh, they had rules for how the process of decision making should should go ahead. They couldn't agree on that. They couldn't agree on the credentials of who ought to be included in the Congress and who ought to be excluded. So they had a fight about that. And this is just a, level, a fight at the level of the rules, not even a fight yet about where the party should go and what it actually stands for. Around the world, it's very rare for parties that emerge out of a party split or breakaway to get traction and become significant players in the short, medium, and especially the long-term future of a country's political system. It, it's very, very rare. There are very few examples around the world. And, and the reason for that is that they don't come, they don't establish themselves by, through political entrepreneurship in trying to represent a sector of society that previously was excluded or marginalized. So in terms of a voting base, that's not their focus. It's not their raison d'etre for, for emerging as a political entity. It comes out of a fight in, in a previous political party so if they can reinvent themselves, then they've got a political future going forward. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to reinvent yourself because you carry that baggage over from the previous ways of behavior, the previous policy environment that you're involved in. It, it's not a rupture. And, and, and that explains why uh, it's so rare for parties to become players um, around the world once they've they've split from, from a, a parent. In South Africa specifically, your article compares the post-1994 transformation of the Democratic Alliance and the formation of COPE. What are the key reasons for the relative success of the DA compared to COPE? When the DA was formed, uh, at the late sort of turn of the, of the century, it was a cobbling together of an old Democratic Party and the National Party, both which had come from uh, the old apartheid political system. And so these two parties had initially combined to keep the ANC literally out of power in, in the Western Cape. Uh, so it was a marriage of convenience, and many people called it that at the time. Of course, they also appeared to have found um, some kind of coming together on certain policy issues, but they were very small, uh, and, and actually in the bigger scheme of things had become more negligible, specifically if you think about the demographic identity of the two parties, it literally was a party of so-called minorities, whites and perhaps a few blacks which had joined the National Party and had started then supporting them. Um, and the same was true for the Democratic Party at the time. When they came together in this formation called the DA, uh, of course, after, after not after, after a short period of time, the kind of cracks had begun to show. There were, again, personality differences between the then leader, Tony Leon, and, and Martinez van, the two leaders, Martinez van Skalkweg. Uh, but beyond that, the kind of policy issues that started, or differences, deep differences on the policy issues that started emerging. But they were able, beyond that, I think, beyond that schism, and, and some of those people then left to go join the ANC, some remained in the DA. But those who remained in the DA were convinced largely about the new kind of policy platform that they had, that they had devised for themselves. Uh, it was a limited role for the state, which was what the NP cohort in the then DA didn't want. So there was some kind of policy accord they could find. They were able to maintain a de greater degree of diversity diversity in kind of approaches to, to, to certain policy issues, but there was an overarching commitment to a set of the broad principles such as the limited role of the state, supply side sort of uh, growth um, in, in the economy, uh, a greater degree of liberalization um, and of, of, state, of state entities and utilities, 
So, so that's the posture that they that kind of broadly agreed on. Of course, coincidentally, it also so happened that there was a racial accord amongst those people who, who thought they would support this party and, and wanted to support this party. So the idea of a minority politics finding expression through this organizational form was able to maintain itself. Now, remember, both of those were distinct from the ANC. They were distinct from the, from, they didn't break away from another party. They formed something, they couldn't find a chord, they had certain cracks. Uh, those who didn't fit in simply hived off. Uh, but literally they didn't endure, as Ivo was suggesting. Those parties don't, don't have a future. So that portion which actually left off had to go join another established party. They couldn't of their own start another party. And those who believed in the vision of the DA uh, remained. And, and of course they as a party have performed consistently um, better in every election that they have participated in. We don't know what the future might, will hold, but, but certainly until thus far, they, they've performed better than most other parties. But that's because they were able to craft uh, a solid identity. They had a commitment for all of those people who were part of it to a certain set of broad principles. Um, so they, they were able to, to, to do this without alienating the remaining support base. Uh, those who were felt alienated had already left um, and hived off. Um, and so I think the difference was that COPE was not able to do that. The, the fight was not just about the personalities. Uh, and to the extent that the fight was about personalities in the DA, uh, those who had a difference left the party voluntarily. In COPE, that was not the case. They carried on, as I was suggesting fighting till the bitter end, because as he says, it was a zero-sum game. Someone wins, and they win everything. Uh, no one leaves, they stay in it for the fight. In the DA, those who remained were prepared to compromise a little bit. Those who weren't didn't stay in and fight till the bitter end, they simply left. Uh, of course, one would say that they found better opportunities elsewhere. As indeed was the case, the ANC offered some of them senior positions. Uh, that was not the case in the DA. So, so I think that's the difference, and 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 perhaps might explain why uh, Cope wasn't able to survive the kind of the kind of internal internal battle. In that vein, you suggest that a split to the left of the ANC, such as that undertaken by the EFF, may have more prospects for success than a split to the right or centre, such as that undertaken by Cope. If we look at party splits in South Africa going back a while in history, from the uh, 1920s splits in the National Party itself, we see that in so-called white politics, um, parties to the right tend to get some tra traction once they've s left uh, the parent party. And uh, we've seen successive more right-wing organizations over time split uh, and emerge and gather support. So the Conservative Party is an example uh, of that. In so-called black politics, it, it seems to be the other way around, is that parties that split to the left seem to have great attraction. So in, the, in, the, in 1959, when the PAC split from the ANC, well, the PAC was formed out of a split in the ANC, um, we see these mass protest marches in Parliament in Cape Town, the Sharpeville campaign, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And it, it seems that in black politics, a more radical voice gets, gains more traction than the more established voice, which is trying to balance a whole range of constituencies. So the initial appeal is, is, is very, very strong. Whether it can be sustained over time is, is, is a big question, and the PAC wasn't able to do that for a whole range of, of, of complex reasons. And I think that logic applies more recently to the EFF. It's, it's much easier to be screaming from the sidelines about everything that needs to be done. Whereas if you're in office and you've got the responsibility of managing budgets, you automatically become more moderate and more center because of responding to complex pressures. And, and that, I think, is part of the appeal of, of the EFF. They can say things that a, a party in power can't. It, it's not to say that it, 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 it's all that. Uh, they, they clearly have tap, tapped into a constituency that felt marginalized 
by the, the, the ANC and the politics of the ANC Youth League in particular and have been very skillful in, 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 in building on that. But we, we need to watch the electoral support over time to see whether it, it's got traction in the medium longer term. So the municipal elections coming will be very important in that to see if they can sustain the electoral success of, of the election a year or so back. Um, and it, it's difficult to speculate or guess on, on where that's going, but I guess it's, it's something that, that people will be watching very closely. You suggest that party factionalism can be properly managed or can lead to dysfunction and breakaways. What are the hallmarks of properly managed factionalism? Well, the one is that there, you know, that there are sufficient rules which are sufficiently adaptable and flexible to allow for a contestation within the party. I don't think parties are going to be unified and homogenous all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it's, I think it's a necessary ingredient uh, to, have, to have factions based on ideas, sometimes even uh, when, when those factions can serve to act as a constraint on runaway executive power concentrated in certain organs of the party. Uh, so it has that advantage. It can act as a constraint. It can also act as an internal oversight mechanism to try and keep uh, the leading faction on point, on message, more or less. You know, not, it's not always going to be precise and perfect. But it can also serve um, to, to as, as a pressure point. It can serve as a as a lid on the kind of of bubbling problems which might exist in the party. Mm -hmm. But if there's sufficient openness and flexibility to have uh, a real debate, a genuine debate about where a party ought to be going, then you can manage factionalism to the benefit of the party. Uh, it can also refine the political message of the party, uh, but. It has to be underlined by sufficient inclusivity, uh, sufficient consultation of its members, and a relatively faithful adherence to the rules of who's included and excluded from decision making. So, you know, when, when there are serious contests over the direction of the party, and you'll see increasingly, even in the ANC, the idea of the credentials, contest over credentials, which is who's, who's accredited to participate in congresses and who's not, or conference decision making and who's not. Those are the key sites at which real initial conflict um, begins to brew. So if there's a faithful adherence to that kind of inclusivity mm -hmm. um, and an absolute respect for the rules which, which allow for inclusion and exclusion, uh, then you can manage the factionalism. But the rules themselves have to be sufficiently um, broad, they have to be consistently applied, there has to be a relative degree of predictability as in all rules which govern behaviour, that they were consistent, that they are predictable, that they are sufficiently open, flexible and inclusive. Mm -hmm. And if they are not perceived to be that, then of course they do become a point of conflict before you even get to the substantive issues of conflict. So I think in that sense, factionalism can be managed and can be healthy. But if the factionalism is merely about predatory interests and with something which is going to contest literally every rule and from every rule, every decision made by a party, then it's very difficult for a party to maintain organizational cohesion. And if you aren't able to maintain organizational cohesion, then your institutional performance in a council, a provincial legislature, a parliament, wherever it might be, starts to, starts to decline because you don't really have an agenda that you're pursuing. Your benchmark suggests that there ought to be a regulation of private funding of political parties. Yet in your chapter, it appears that you suggest that disclosure and transparency may not be the best way to go forward. Are you suggesting that there shouldn't be any regulation? Well, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any regulation. I, I'm, I'm questioning a particular form of regulation, which is the disclosure issue. Mm -hmm. So around the world, there's this movement to say that disclosing private donations above a set threshold is the best way of regulating private donations to political parties. So if the money is disclosed, voters know who made the donations and it, it, it's argued that it improves the, 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 the cleanliness of the political system. And 
I, I, I challenge that. I, I make the case that in many countries around the world where you've got very rigorous disclosure mechanisms, it just doesn't work because when there's money in politics, people circumvent all of those processes. So in America, in America now, they've got a, a wonderful way of avoiding disclosure. You make donations to a, a, a political action committee <laughs> uh, and it's all anonymous. Uh, so who ends up declaring the mom and pop donations of a couple of hundred dollars each? They're not the influence peddlers. The influence peddlers are buying influence at a much higher level. So my, my sense is that it's, it's a huge amount of effort with very little transparency uh, clean, cleaning up uh, dividend. And that when one thinks about uh, regulating party finance, one has to look at other avenues. At the same time, uh, disclosure can impact negatively on smaller minority parties. Because if donors perceive a retribution in making donations mm -hmm. to opposition parties, they, yeah. they won't withheld money to smaller parties, mm -hmm. which inhibits them from expanding and sending out their message. And uh, if you fear that you, you won't get government contracts, you won't make those donations. Mm -hmm. So it's a perception. I'm not saying it happens, but it, it's a perception. Mm -hmm. so, so there are a whole range of negative consequences to disclosure as a particular form of regulation. But there are other ways of regulating political finance, uh, and there are many examples around this around the world. One could have caps on spending. So you don't have to reveal your donors, but you have an enforced cap on what parties can spend in an election. Mm -hmm. And they've got to publish their audited expenditure accounts. So yes, of course, they can abuse that. But you'll still get a sense of what's being done behind the scenes in terms of a party's electoral support. So, so caps on expenditure is quite a, a, a powerful way of, of, of dealing with that. Um, so it, it means just being creative about how we think about regulation mm -hmm. and not just trot out disclosure as the only way of doing it and seeing it as the, the solution to a very, very difficult set of problems. That was Ibrahim Fakir and Ivor Sarakinski speaking to Crema Media's Polity about politics in South Africa.